Brady Murray is the founder and president of Rod's Heroes, which is a nonprofit organization with the mission to inspire families to adopt children with special needs or other unique circumstances. Today, he shares one orphan with us named Johan. Johan has been in the orphanage since six years old. He's now 15 and he has a heart of gold. He's also diagnosed with 22Q. Rod's Heroes is trying to find placement for him before the end of November 2023, and we're hoping that this episode can help Johan find his forever family. Brady also shares his own journey as a father to a 22Q son named Ridge and what that experience has been like for both of them. So I'm honored to introduce you to Brady. Welcome to the 22Q podcast. My name is Becky White, and today I am thrilled to have the founder and president of Rod's Heroes with us today. I was contacted by one of his team members that they had a young gentleman, young man, who is looking for his forever home. And to share a little bit of background about Rod's Heroes and who they are, Rod's Heroes is a nonprofit organization with the mission to inspire families to adopt children with special needs or other unique circumstances. And over the last decade, Rod's Heroes has inspired the adoption of 102 children, 83 of whom have Down syndrome, providing them with loving forever homes. And today we have the one and only president and founder, Brady Murray with us today. And Brady, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time and sharing Johan's story with us. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Way excited to uh, share about Johan and Rod's Heroes and obviously my love and passion for the special needs community. Yes. Well, thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you. And, you know, how did you come up with this idea of this amazing and much needed nonprofit? So in 2007, uh, we were expecting our second child, my first son. And shortly after Nash was born, the doctor told me that he has Down syndrome. And that was my introduction into the special needs world as a special needs parent. Um, that, was a, uh, that was a painful conversation to have. Um, there was considerable uh, emotion that was associated with that for me and, um, and also for Andrea. But we believe wholeheartedly in this concept of serving the pain that we know best. Mm -hmm. And we were now parents of a child that has Down syndrome, and we wanted to lean into this wholeheartedly with everything that we had. Mm -hmm. And so it was through the inspiration of our son that we learned that there are many children throughout the world that have special needs like Down syndrome or 22Q that we um, that are in need of a family that are orphans. And so Andrea and I have a heart for children and a heart for orphans and a heart for special needs. And so it was through those, those feelings that we started Rod's Heroes to help inspire families to answer the call to adopt one of these children. Mm -hmm. That is beyond admirable. And I'm just thinking as a parent of a special needs child, how did you find the strength and the passion and drive to do this because that is not easy. That is a tall mountain to climb and tackle. And you and the Rod's Heroes are doing an incredible job. I mean, 102 children have been adopted. That's incredible. How did you even get started on this journey? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I my personal belief is that all of us have something inside of us that we are specifically called to do. And that, that calling is fulfilled in and through the service of others. And I don't think that that's just for, you know, special people or for people that are capable or anything else. I, I believe that that is for everybody, whether that's somebody that has 22Q, has Down syndrome, or a typical person, we all have a divine potential. And I believe that it's um, life circumstances and experiences that we experience that will help guide us to know what those divine callings are, if you may. 
And so Nash being born into my family, I don't think was by happen chance. And I knew that and I felt that. And I knew I wanted to explore and understand why and, and what that calling was. And so really when, when we learned about children that have special needs that are tucked away in many of these orphanages throughout the world, it was not, uh, it was not a matter of how are we going to do this? It was a matter of like, how are we going to focus on other stuff outside of this? Because this is now our life's mission, if you will. So that's, that's really how that came about. Yeah. Thank you. And so you said Nash was your second, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. So if you don't mind, how, what would you mind sharing your family? Uh, how, yeah. how many children do you have? Yeah, it's, it's been an updated, uh, updated process as of about six days ago, <laughs> we just finalized the, the adoption of our, uh, four children from Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, just got home, uh, less than a week ago. And so right now we have we have 11 children in our family. Um, two of our children uh, have Down syndrome. So Nash, who I shared, we also adopted a little boy from China named Cooper, who has Down syndrome in 2016. We have two children that we fostered for three years that we adopted, and then these four children that we just adopted. And so there's seven adopted, four biological. And I would say uh, this is something very uh, near and dear and and heavy on my heart as well. My uh, child, my son, who's 14, has 22Q as well. Mm -hmm. He was diagnosed with that when he was, I believe, two. And um, that has been a unique and special journey for us as well. So how has it been unique? You said it was unique. You know, when um, when Nash was born, the doctor told me he has Down syndrome. And it was like, uh, you know, going into a dark room and you turn the light on and there's no denying, like the light is now on. And I am a father, you know, immediately I knew I was a father of a child with special needs. And so you immediately start to process that. When, when Ridge was diagnosed, um, it was after he had a, a surgery where they had to fix a hole in his soft palate, which is one of the markers for 22Q. And the doctor, the pediatrician said, you know, I, I, I would suggest that we um, test for 22Q. And I said, I don't know what that is. <laughs> what is that? And she said, don't Google it. Don't look it up. We'll just test it and we'll see. And he came back um, having that. And um, she said, look, this is just a little boy. Don't worry about it. Just carry on and forget about, forget about this. And I don't, I don't know if that was great advice or not, but I wholeheartedly engaged with that. Mm -hmm. And so for the last um, decade, I would say, so Ridge is 14 now, that's when he was 12. And so probably for the, it wasn't until last year, to be honest, that I could have even said what Ridge had. I didn't. Wow. I, I literally blocked it out of my mind that much. I took was very specific to the doctor's orders in that respect. Yeah. And now that Ridge is at an age where he's going through puberty and and we're seeing the various symptoms of 22Q surface more and, and become much more prevalent, um, that has caused me very much to dive deep dive into the condition just to best serve my son. And mm -hmm. again, I'm not saying this is was right what what I've done over the last decade but it uh it's become very real very fast and um I would say it's much more like a sunrise versus a light getting turned on with realizing what the new norm is as it relates to my son who I love very much and is very capable and I coach all his ball teams and he's a typical kid just like anybody else but as you know you personally know the symptoms on this condition um, reveal themselves in different ways at different times in life. And so that's something that's very near and dear to my heart right now. Mm -hmm. You want to know how it happened, how it yes. really came about? It, it was Johan. Really? Yeah. So and how well, did Johan's story can, how, how'd that happen? Yeah. And so I apologize if I get emotional on this, but no. I just believe wholeheartedly that, um, like I say, that um, we all have a divine purpose. And um, 
Andrea and I, as you as you have shared, we we've been with Rod's Heroes. We've we've worked in Rod's Heroes for over the last decade. And last summer in July, in July of 22, I should say, we were in Columbia, and we went to an orphanage where it was all very very extreme special needs, and. Um, most everybody in there was in a wheelchair, nonverbal, um, all orphaned children. And, uh, you know, that was hard to see. And so as we spent a couple of days there and the purpose was to be able to create content of these children. They're all eligible for adoption. So we use this content to inspire families to adopt. And as we were there, there was there was a young man who was helping all of these kids, all of these kids in wheelchairs, and he was wheeling them around. And he just had a big smile on his face. And he had, he was spoon feeding these children and wiping their face. And he's just a little guy, you know, but just just a very special spirit about him. And I remember looking at him and saying, he looks like Ridge. He looks just like Ridge. And so, as you know, there's facial features specifically to 22Q at the time. I, I actually didn't know that, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, this was all out of sight, out of mind. And I said, he just looks like Ridge and he reminds me so much of, of Ridge. And towards the latter part of the, the second day, we learned Johan is, a, is an orphan and we were able to get to know him and capture footage of him. And we just fell in love with him. And uh, we were talking with one of the workers there and uh, asking about Johan. And she said, he's such a sweet boy and he is just the biggest helper. And he is such a blessing to our orphanage here. And she said, you know, it was just the other day he asked me, he said, you know, we see all, or he's, he, she said, Johan has been here essentially most of his life. And he's seen many children come and get adopted and then leave. And he said, just the other day, he asked me, why, why has nobody ever adopted me? And I was just very emotional in hearing this. And so I, I really took it upon myself to do a deep dive into Johan. And, and I looked through his file and just really tried to better understand who this young man was. And it was there that I learned that he has 22Q11. And it was then that I thought, I've heard that before. And that's when Andrea reminded me and said, that's what Ridge has, honey. That's what our son has. And uh, that's actually what caused me to say, look, I've really got to understand what this condition is and what this means. And um, that was that was a very uh, tender mercy that it was through the service of Johan that it caused me to be able to engage in, in what my son's needs are. And mm-hmm. uh, I actually carry a lot of guilt. I didn't do that a lot earlier, but I'm, you know, I'll, I'll get over that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, so fast forward to September and Andrea and I um, just felt strongly in our hearts that we were supposed to adopt again. And um, we ended up adopting this, you know, committing to this group of four siblings, as I just shared, we just finalized that adoption. And, but I, um, I really wanted to adopt Johan. And, uh, I knew, I knew that, that we were supposed to adopt the kids that we did, but that has weighed on me for a long time because I feel a stewardship and a responsibility to get him a family. And especially mm-hmm. a stewardship and responsibility right now, because um, he's on the verge of aging out, meaning not being eligible to be adopted. Johan is 15, and um, we have until about Thanksgiving to have a family mm-hmm. come forward and commit. Obviously, the adoption won't be finalized by then, but we, we need to have a family committed. It's hard to even say that because... You know, today is November 1st. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's the last <laughs> month. And so we're doing our best to be able to, to help him find a family. I um, 
And so that's why I'm on this podcast today is to share about him. I'd, I'd be happy to share more about yeah. this and a little bit more about my experience with him. But he uh, he is just a tiny little guy. Um, I've seen him multiple times. Uh, we went back there in October, spent some more time with him. He actually came to Utah this summer, was part of the hosting program that we had in conjunction with the, the, the government down there to where we had 10 children come to Utah and they were here for two weeks for a summer hosting program. So he's been to my house and he swam in my pool and he loves everything about the United States. I can vouch yeah. for that. He loved it here. He, he did so well here. Mm -hmm. um, and as I shared, he's 15. I would say that Johan is probably, if you were to talk to him and to meet him, you'd probably think he's more like 11 or 12. Um, just a very little guy, as I shared, and and definitely not the maturity level, I would say, of a 15-year-old, definitely more in that 11 or 12 range. Um, his host family loved him so much, and he was best friends with the neighborhood kids. Um, he he um, became very close friends with the neighborhood kids, and even though they didn't speak the same language, they, they become besties, and yeah. uh, that was kind of a special thing as well. So it's a little bit about Johan. Yeah. Thank you. And in Colombia, once he turns 16, what then happens for those of us that don't know and aren't familiar with the adoption process? When I was uh, in Colombia, so I've been in Colombia most of the month of October. Um, we were there 27 days. And I, I asked that. I asked what happens and uh, to the, the people that work in that system. And this did give some peace of mind that he actually will stay in the orphanage where he's at. And um, because he has a, you know, a special need, um, it looks like he could stay there indefinitely oh, in good. that orphanage, um, which is positive. But I also, uh, I just have a hard time processing the thought of this little guy never having a mom or dad never having a family you know he, he has a song he's meant to sing as well and and it's possible that his song is meant to be in that orphanage serving the people that are there because he is a servant's heart for sure um and so i i would say i'm at peace if at the end of the day that's the path that we need to go but i'm not going to stop advocating for him until until we can't advocate anymore so that's mm -hmm. that's what will happen with Johan. Yeah. And if there's someone out there listening that this is a person that they think they would want to join their family, what would that process look like if someone is interested in yeah. adopting Johan? What is it, how does that work? What do they I need know to do? the process very well. I just finished it. And so it uh actually Andrea knows it much better than I do, but <laughs> process itself um, is um, the process itself takes about a year. And so if okay. a family started today and said, that's my boy, we want to adopt Johan, then you would expect to travel in about a year from now. And so that year process is full of a lot of paperwork. Uh, there would be a home study that would be done in your home to where a, a licensed social worker would come to your home, do a home study. There would be some psychological evaluations of um, husband and wife. Um, all of the children in the family would be interviewed. The husband and wife would be interviewed. Um, they would do extensive background checks. There would be many different fingerprints that you would get to do. And, um, and there's a lot of hurry up and wait. There's various steps that are, um, required. And so, you know, you, you do the paperwork and, and you rush, 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 and you get to that and you submit it and then you wait. And then you're just waiting, waiting, waiting. And there's certain um, processes with the adoption agency that they would be going through working with um, the U.S. Uh, government entity, the Colombian government entity, et cetera. And so I'll go through every detail, but, you know, then the next process will get approved and then you'll hurry and do what you need to do for that. And you'll rush, 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 and then you'll wait. And sometimes you'll wait two weeks and four weeks or six weeks, but it's just a hurry up and wait game. And so as you go throughout that process, 
you finally get to the place where you're matched with the child. They formally are or officially going to become your child. That The entities agree on that. And then you ultimately would get a travel date. And you would travel to Colombia. You would travel to Bogota is where um, this young man is at. You would spend about, we were there 27 days. And so it's between 26 and 28 days that you would spend in Colombia, which is amazing, by the way. I know that sounds a little bit taught, you know, daunting, but that is a special, special experience. Um, during that entire time, your child would be with you. Johan would be with you. And you would get to go see the sights and you would get to enjoy the amazing food and just experience the culture. There's obviously some doctor's appointments and um, appointments with the embassy and appointments with, to get passports. And that's why it takes so long down there. But more than anything, it's a great opportunity to experience Colombia with, with your son. And uh, then you come home. Amazing. That's, that's a pretty special experience to bring your child home and so it's very much at the top of my my mind right now because as I said we're six days into it right now of having our four children in our home and we're experiencing a lot of firsts with them you know it was their first time on an airplane it was their first time um we had uh trick-or-treating actually I think right last night that was kind of fun and what they think of that? <laughs> they love it. Yeah, they, they? what well, the biggest problem is, I don't know what we're going to do with all this candy. We, <laughs> we had nine of our 11 kids were trick-or-treating and each one of them filled up about a, I don't know, <laughs> almost a pillowcase, I would say. And we got a lot of candy that we need yeah. to discard of somehow. Right. Slow. So yeah, that's the process. Thank you. Because those of us that aren't familiar with it, it it's yeah. new to us and, and it's, it's good to have that little brief window of what it's like. Um, yeah, you, and you would be working with an adoption agency. In this case, would be Madison Adoption. Broad Heroes is not an adoption agency that uh, Madison handles all of this. Um, there's in-country guides and drivers. And like we were so well taken care of and catered to with our in-country people while we were there. We were very just well taken care of. It was awesome. Right. right. That's wonderful. Thank you for just having that insight and and sharing what the process is like. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with it, but that's a really great kind of small window to what it would of, be like. Yeah. A lot of times people ask, well, like, do they speak English? Yeah. And the answer is no. Johan speaks Spanish and right. he would learn English. And um, mm -hmm. you'd be amazed at how well you can communicate, even not knowing the language, number one, but um, you will also be very surprised at how quickly they learn the language. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing mm -hmm. that firsthand in my home right now. Right. Yeah. The universal language is a smile, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing all of that about Johan. We're going to do our best here at the 22Q podcast to share this. And for any listeners that are listening, please share this podcast episode with everyone on your social media. If you know someone that could help us spread this message, please share this podcast and this YouTube video with them. And then that way we can hopefully find a forever home for Johan. Um, but you mentioned, you know, how I loved how you mentioned between Ridge's story and Johan's story with the 22 Q, how with your other son, Cooper and Nash, how that was kind of like a, a light turning on. Yeah. And then how with Ridge, it was a slow sunrise. I think that's yeah. beautiful. It's a yeah. beautiful way to describe the surprise and the grief process that many families, many parents of 22Q children feel. Yep. And it's this grief of a child that you were originally planning for and now mm -hmm. You were given a different child, a beautiful child full of joy and love, but it's different. Yep. Um, I didn't know if you wouldn't mind sharing how that journey is going for you with Ridge. And yeah. as a dad, I have lots of moms on this podcast. So whenever I get a dad on, I love just hearing oh. your perspective because it is different for both parents in the family. You both grieve differently yep. and you both experience it differently. So yeah. I don't know if you wouldn't mind sharing. 
of course. And so as I had shared just on, upon diagnosis, and again, this was after Nash was born. So I'd already been through what a diagnosis is like. And, and truthfully, I think that added a lot to it. I, I wasn't ready to go through that again. And so that's kind of how I think I compartmentalized that out of my mind and couldn't even say what Rich had up until last year, truthfully. Um, I would say all along though, I see my son um, struggle in school. Um, we held him back in the second grade. Mm -hmm. I see him see that he's uh, not as fast a learner as his peers. And, um, you know, it's unique because Ridge makes friends very well. He's a social kid. Um, he, I've coached his sports. He's a good little baseball player. He, you know, he is a typical kid and, and he is very just awesome that way. But as he's getting older, I, I see, I just see him struggling mm -hmm. right now. Um, Ridge is not in school. Um, we, uh, right before we left to Columbia, um, we had been working with the administration and he's just so far behind now that we knew it was time for us to seek alternate mm -hmm. education. And so we, we took him out of school and he went to Columbia with us Great. and was there uh, for the whole 27 days. Uh, he is the favorite sibling for his Colombian uh, siblings, for sure. <laughs> they call him Ridge Chito is his Aww. nickname. And, uh, but, you know, like as of right now, as of this morning, Andrea and I have just been pondering and praying and just really trying to seek inspiration on what's best for Ridge. Um, with that being said, um, Ridge has so many talents and so many abilities and has such a tremendous superpower in, in the role that he plays in particular with his adoptive siblings. And so that's the role. But uh, at the same time, it is very challenging as a dad to um, see your son experience what he's experiencing. And, you know, I, I think most people, if given the opportunity to say, do I have a child with Down syndrome or do I have a child with 22Q? Like, I think they immediately are like 22Q, like they'll be, you know, they'll have a job and they could get, they're going to get married. And, you know, there's just struggles. But like for me, um, the 22Q has been so much harder yeah. than the Down syndrome that we have with our other two children. Because when people see Nash and Cooper, they immediately know he has, they have Down syndrome and they have a certain expectation and uh, they're, they're innocent in a very loving and special way. And with Ridge, you know, he's just realizing more and more his differences that other people just don't see and they don't know immediately upon seeing him. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a process that the sunrise is still coming up right now for all of us. It is. Thank you. I, I hope that you're able to pray on it and figure out what's best for him. Yeah. That is so hard. I, I find that, you know, with me and my journey with 22Q with my son, I sometimes with certain things say it's a moving target. Right. And I'll be sobbing on the floor with my husband and I'll be like, why is this so hard? I thought we had this answer. I thought this was right. And we'll remind ourselves it's a moving target. It's, that's and a good way to describe it. It's it, but it's so hard some days when you think you finally found his place and what yep. you want, what you think is right for them. And then it's just not working. Um, right. It's very discouraging. And, yeah. and all you want to do is help. That's right. And make yeah, it right. You, just, you don't want your child to be disappointed. You don't want mm -hmm. them to experience the pain. Yeah. I wish you could take that away from them, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you can just be there with them through it. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful that you were able to take him with you to Columbia and let it him was have, awesome. Let was him have a break so and cool. just reset for all of yep. you and bond and and have a good time. What what did he enjoy the most down there, other than meeting I, his new siblings? But what question. did he like? I, I would say that, um, I'd be interested to ask him, but I would say he would say the, the being with his siblings. And so one of the places we stayed had a pool and you'd think that those kids were actually fish because they never <laughs> left the pool. And they had so much fun together and playing tag and 
just you know teasing each other and just joking around with each other and it was so cute because neither of them speak the language of the other but yet there was just this bond that was developed between them that was so so cute but yeah. like I say that's Ridge's superpower like yeah. that's that's his special ability that he has is mm -hmm. is with these these kids that come into our family uh through uh alternate means so yeah. You, you bring up a good point, you know, for Johan's case, if someone's listening and they're thinking, oh, well, I don't speak Spanish. How would this work? How could we bring him into our family? You know, what kind of advice or firsthand advice would you have for them to kind of ease their nerves about the, the language barrier? Well, and I, I can speak from firsthand experience with our kids, but also firsthand experience with Johan, you know, having spent a considerable time with him, I would say, I would say he's he's just a boy he's just a boy and all he needs is a shot he just needs somebody to believe in him and all of those details on language and what school and what's his condition exactly and all of those things tend to work themselves out when somebody just gives that little boy a shot mm -hmm. and I've seen it dozens and dozens of times and it's a beautiful thing I would describe adoption as the most uh, beautiful, hard thing I have ever experienced in my life. It is uh, truly a, a blessing and also a, a challenge, but there is no growth in the comfort zone and there's no comfort in the growth zone. And I would look at adoption as uh, truly one of the biggest blessings of my life outside of my relationship with my wife. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the growth and the beautiful I would say the beautiful sunrises that I never would have saw otherwise um, that sometimes require an early morning hike into a top of a mountain, but well worth the effort. Yeah. I love that. Oh my goodness. You brought me to tears. Um, I love that. He's just a boy and a boy. looking for love. Yep. Great. Yep. That's right. If you had to use one word to describe Johan, what would it be? Johan, I would say. I would say is selfless. That boy is in a servant's heart. And um, that's a boy that has consecrated his entire life to serving those that can't speak for themselves, that can't feed themselves, that can't care for themselves. He spent his entire life serving them. And uh, there's very few people, I would say, in the world that could say that they have spent their entire life in the service of those least among us who, mm -hmm. who need the most. And um, come, with that has come a very, very special, special young man um, that I know would be a tremendous blessing to a family. Yeah. Like I said, I, I wanted to adopt him myself. And that uh, pains me that I can't. Um, I actually asked more than once and Columbia said no. <laughs> and uh, I even asked on this adoption, I said, okay, this adoption is almost done. Can I come back? And they said, no. And I understand why it's yeah. so we can continue to focus on our children that we have right now. But I would really like to see this young man be able to get his family and be able to sing the song he's meant to sing because mm -hmm. he's got a lot of good to give and a lot of good still left to do in his, in his life. Yeah. Oh, what you're doing is just amazing. I, and I have so much respect and, and I'm just blown away by your family and by Rod's heroes. When I heard about it, I just thought to myself, wow, this is so needed. Uh, so, so needed. I wish there were more organizations like yourself. Um, but we really hope here at the 22Q podcast that we're able to help you find Johan a home and if anyone wants to learn more or contact you directly or your team, what's the best way that they can do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can send us an email at hero or hero at rods.org. So H E R O um, at uh, rods.org, R O D S.org. The other thing is most of the inquiries, ironically enough, come through our social media channels. So our Instagram channel is. Uh, rods heroes and you can send us a dm there and so our team 
is all here. We're ready to visit with you and make the proper introductions over to the adoption agency if it's a good fit. So mm -hmm. great. Thank you. And we'll put all of that in the description of this podcast so people can take a look and click right there and we'll direct you also to their website. So mm -hmm they can find out more because you do have a wonderful little blurb all about Johan right out there on the website I was reading about. So thank yeah. you again. And I did want to ask you a few more questions about Ridge and his journey. Um, you had mentioned, okay. So when he was two, Dude. you found out, yep. but then and he I, had the palate surgery at 12. No, he had that at two. It was through the palate oh, surgery okay. that we actually found out. And um, wow. that was, you know, that was ultimately when I just mentally, <laughs> blocked that from my mind mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't until it was actually last year and so Ridge yeah. would have been 13 when um, when I would say I had really the epiphany on okay let's see what this is all about and what this actually is and mm -hmm. so yeah that must have been a challenging process for you just oh to... I I um we Andrea and I actually were doing a well yeah we had a meeting with Ridge's school because he was struggling and we met with all of his teachers. And um, this was right after we got back from Columbia and we had this experience with Johan. And so on the trip home, I learned, I, I just studied, I did the Google search I should have done 10 years earlier and just watched all the videos and learned everything that I could. And that was just weighing on me. And then immediately we had this meeting with his school because he was struggling with all of his teachers and they were so kind, but it was very clear that Ridge was just really struggling. And we went out in the car after, and I just cried because that was like the first time that, you know, I think I had to accept that this path is different than what it is, what I hoped it would be. And I think for the last decade, I was trying to um, beat the odds, if you may. And and I, with Ridge, I, I, I actually spend time with Ridge probably more than any other child, just because we have very similar interests in baseball and fishing mm -hmm. and outdoors and different things. And we just get along really well. And I just thought that, you know, together with Ridge, he and I are going to beat the odds and this won't even be an issue. And and it was in that moment that I realized that this is something we're going to need to address. And so mm -hmm. that was a year ago, you know, that was last year. And fast forward mm -hmm. where we are right now, it's definitely not got better, but, um, but we're, we're taking it one day at a time. All you can do. That's all you can do at times. Someday, sometimes one hour at a time, um, yeah. but that's all you can do. And it yep. sounds like he will find his way. He will find he will. the right education and the right, um, the right uh, education atmosphere for him. Right. And that will help him. That's where we're at right now. That's yeah. really what we're in the middle of. So it doesn't make it hurt any less, but right. you just find the right fit. The hardest um, part I, I think is just the seeing the disappointment and just that, like he's, he's old enough to know what's going on and we've talked to him about it we've talked to him about 22q and he knows but that that doesn't make it easy for him to have to process yeah. it's his own journey that he's experiencing I and mean, my heart just goes out for him in that respect has he been able to connect with any other kids with 22q we have not believe yeah. it or not we have not um that's actually a great suggestion um it's, it's, i'm not even sure how we would actually yeah. I mean, it, it, like you were mentioning before about down syndrome and how people just look at your other boys and say, Oh, down syndrome. Okay. Yeah. They're acting that way. Oh, they have down syndrome. That's fine. Yeah. And then you mentioned Ridge and it's, it is the invisible diagnosis. Yeah. It's right. It's something he has and should be, it's just something he has is 22 Q and, but it is challenging at times. Yeah. So it's, and it's really hard to have that invisible difference. Yeah. Really, really right. hard. And it can feel isolating um, from the individuals that I've interviewed here on the podcast that have 22Q. They've shared their struggles and journeys. And um, anybody listening that wants to connect, um, feel free to reach out and uh, hopefully we can connect and maybe well, I, Zoom or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel super thankful to have made this connection. I'm actually really intrigued and interested to go back and listen to prior episodes. 
um, this is a tremendous resource. And um, as, as I shared, I've been all in in the Down syndrome community and um, definitely love it and am a big part of that. But I know and, and feel that now is the time to do the exact same thing with the 22Q community. So I'm thankful to be a part of it. Well, I think well, that you're a part of it and that Ridge is a part of our community too. So, um, and as we always say here on the 22Q podcast, know that you're not alone and that there's thousands of us, thousands and thousands of families out there that are also going through 22Q together. So Thank it's you. a big mess. That's yeah. super comforting, actually. That, yeah. That's incredible. Great, yeah. great work. Yeah, no. And, and I think that's, an important message for everyone. And I hope that, um, you find the right path for Ridge. We wish you the best of luck on this journey. And, um, I'm going to be sharing some resources with you after the podcast to help you, you out. But, uh, I also just want to say final notes on Johan for anyone listening. Don't forget to contact and reach out to Rod's heroes and learn more on their website at rods.org. Um, let's work together, share this, and hopefully find Johan and his forever family. Yeah. And I didn't know if you had any more, any last words that you want no. to share or anything I didn't touch upon? No, I, I really appreciate you being uh, so kind and welcoming me on this podcast to not only share about Johan, but also uh, share about Ridge. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I forgot to ask you, you know, if you had to describe one word for Ridge, what would it be? Ridge, 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 Ridge. Ridge is, um, I would say Ridge is the connector. He is the connector. And mm -hmm. so he has a very special superpower to be able to help <laughs> a, a, uh, a boy that was left on a street corner in mainland China in a city of 14 million people with Down syndrome be welcomed into our into our family and uh, two little girls that uh, came to us as just little infants after a very traumatic first 18 months of their life. Uh, Ridge was the great connector and the glue and he's doing the exact same thing right now mm -hmm. with four children in Columbia that just needed a shot and uh, Ridge is the great connector, I would say. He sounds like a beautiful soul. He is. <laughs> and if he ever hears this podcast episode what would you want him to know from his dad i'd say i'm proud of you son keep up the great work I'm very proud of who you have become and i can't wait to see who you are going to become awesome well oh my goodness brady thank you so much for being on today we wish you the best of luck with your 11 children <laughs> And your wonderful wife, who sounds remarkable as well. So we wish you and your family all the best. And we will do our best to help Johan find his forever home. So thank you again for the time today. Thank you. Brady, thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing Johan's story with us. We hope that he can find placement and we hope that people can share this episode to everyone and anyone so that Johan can have a chance of having his forever family. We also want to thank you for sharing your own personal story with Ridge and navigating his 22Q. We wish you the best of luck to you and your family and know that even though the sun is rising on his 22Q diagnosis and you're learning a little bit more, know that there are a group of us already wearing our sunglasses and hats ready to help and it only gets brighter from here. So thank you again for sharing your heart with us today. And to all of our listeners, thank you for following, subscribing, and sharing this podcast. You are helping to raise awareness about 22Q. And if you'd like to reach me, you can contact me at 22QPodcast at gmail.com with any questions, or if you'd like to be on the podcast, feel free to reach out. And as always, 22Q family, never forget that you are not alone.